episode of Corona Chemistry, where this video will cover solution equilibrium and all things buffers, titrations, and KSP. Equilibrium has been a bulk of our conversations over the last few weeks. And here we are, arriving to almost its conclusion, I think. I think there's an, another unit that revolves around it. We'll, we'll see. Let's play it by ear. Let's, let's keep those minds open to the possibilities. Now this, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie. In my opinion, this is one of the biggest doozies of AP chemistry. And yet, Corona chemistry, what are we going to do? We're going to grease that wheel. And we're going to make that pill go down nice and easy. So buckle up, strap in, and as always, you can find the notes and links to the slides on the screen right here in front of you down below in the description of this video. I do apologize for the small glitch in our setup. Green screen out of commission at the moment, but don't worry. I've got this lovely hotkey over here. Oh, oh, where'd I go? Oh, oh. Can always get out of the way at a moment's notice. So bear with me. Let's jump into it. Solution equilibrium, where of course... We're going to be talking about acids and bases interacting with one another. A spicy concoction that has been a part of our chemistry lives since almost the very beginning. Right? Acids and bases getting together, that is known as a neutralization reaction. One of the three types of reactions that actually exist in chemistry. And always what it forms is a salt and water. A salt and water. Very important to note that. And of course, we know our strong acids. No so clo clo clebri, if you know, you know. Right? Anything that is not in that list is a weak acid, and our strong bases are almost all of the group 1 and 2 metal hydroxides, aside from magnesium and beryllium. Those are our strong bases there. And so, when we're looking at these equilibrium expressions, we know that weak acids aren't fully dissociating, and that's what differentiates a strong acid from a weak acid. And so the interaction is slightly different. It's still forming that salt and water that we are looking at, but really what we're looking at are the conjugates that are formed. Because what buffers are is they are a network relationship between a weak acid and a conjugate base. Or a weak base and its conjugate acid. A constant back and forth that allows them to go both ways in the reaction. And so we see down below in this example we have acetic acid reacting with the base. Right? We don't care about the spectator ion sodium in this example. All we care about is acetic acid reacting with hydroxide to form chiku, the conjugate base of acetic acid and water. That's what we're looking at here. And so buffers, because of this network that is formed, are able to resist large pH changes. Of course, to a certain point. When we run out of the participating ingredients, the weak acid and the conjugate base usually, uh, then we obviously can't maintain that balance anymore. And this is all due to what is known as the common ion effect. When we have two things that are so closely related to one another, in fact, the only thing separating them from one another is a hydrogen. Well, then they are able to go back and forth depending on what is interacting and what is uh, intruding on the space that we have. For example, you've got a weak acid sitting in a solution, right? Just weak acid in water. It is going to dissociate to some extent and create some of that conjugate base and hydrogen ions floating around in it. But it still has some of that weak acid in there. So let's think in our brain what is happening in both scenarios. What if I introduce a base to the system? Well, that means there's the weak acid there to interact with it and react with it. Well, what if an acid enters the system? Well, then that means the conjugate base is there to react with it and interact with it and neutralize it. And so because both of these things are present in the solution working in tandem, they are able to neutralize virtually anything that comes into it. But of course, there's a limit to how much we have in there, and that is when the buffer is no more. That's the common ion effect that we are looking at here. And an equation that binds it all together. And let me get my face out of the way here. The Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. pH is equal to the pKa plus log of the concentration of A minus over the concentration of the weak acid. And so, of course, this can also transition with bases as well. Although, we are almost always going to be working with the acid form of this. I don't, I mean, I, I know why I always think of this guy. But maybe you guys are too young to remember. Elite! Hall of Fame caliber Seattle Seahawks starting quarterback Matt Hasselbeck. I think he was actually playing for the Seahawks whenever I was in high school. Maybe that's why I resonated with it so much. Um, but this equation was a welcome sight. It's a plug and chug type of equation. Now, yes, we are working with things that might be totally familiar with us, like PKAs. That's fairly new to us with equilibrium and all that. But pH, that's nothing new. Molarity, that's nothing new. 
This equation is simple. There's nothing new here. The log button on my calculator is going to do the heavy lifting. And then remember what brackets means. Brackets means we are utilizing the concentration of the conjugate base over the conjugate or over the weak acid that we are employing here. Okay. So let's check out an example here. This is a very, very basic example. Just get our feet wet, right? If we are told that the Ka of acetic acid, which this is one of the most common weak acids we're going to use here, as it is the primary ingredient that makes vinegar acidic, is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. What is the pH of a buffer form from 0 0.40 molar of acetic acid and 0 0.90 molar of chiku, the conjugate base of acetic acid? Well, the one thing to remember about this equation is that it is always the conjugate over the original form, right? If you are talking about the base variance of this equation, it is always the conjugate acid over the original base. That's what we were looking at here. And so because this is the pH and we're working with an acid, we're going to put the conjugate base, which is chiku, over the original acid acetic acid now these are the concentrations and this question of course simple as can be because it is straight up giving you the concentrations here if they were giving you milliliters or moles then you need to actually plug it in and get the molarity right we cannot do it without those values and so we just get a value of ph equals 5.10 calculator spits it out i like when equations give me the answers to questions that they are looking for and so if you think about what is happening here we're going into the next process, which of course is us talking about titrations. What this is typically doing is you've got a known concentration of a base and you are going to slowly dispense it into an unknown concentration of acid. And this is typically using a burette, which is a very, very long vertical tube. Uh, you're going to put the base in the tube and then you're going to have the unknown concentration of acid down below. And there's a little stopcock that you tilt just a little bit, that dispenses just a couple drops every second, right? And you're tracking the volume of base that you're dispensing into it. And we use different color changing indicators to mark when all of the acid has been reacted. Because then based on the amount of base that has been dispensed, we can backtrack and calculate how much acid was in there in the first place. Because of this relationship. If I put base into a system that has both the acid and the conjugate base, every bit of base that goes in there will be reacted with the acid that is originally in there until there is no acid left. And so one of the most common indicators used here is phenolphthalein, which I know that you've heard in your first level of chemistry, whether you actually did something with it or not, you know that bases turn phenolphthalein pink. If phenolphthalein is present in an acidic or a neutral solution, it's supposed to remain colorless. It turns pink when it touches a base. So the moment that your solution turns the slightest rose shade of pink and stays there, that is when you know the solution has gone ever so slightly basic, a.k.a. all of your acid is gone. Huh? That's what we're working with here. And the point in which the acid equals the base where you have put in exactly enough base to react with all of the acid that was originally present in that solution, that is known as the equivalence point. A very, very important definition to nail here. And then notice there's also um, this starred statement here. There actually is questions that you need to ask yourself if you're setting up simulations or scenarios in what indicator you should be using. And this is a fact they love to throw on AP tests from my experience. It is best to use an indicator whose pKa matches the pH at the equivalence point of the titration you're performing. So if you know that it's a weak acid strong base or strong acid weak base, whatever you're titrating with one another, you know roughly where your pH is going to be at your equivalence point, and that is going to allow you to pick a suitable indicator for that. Uh, there, there's just Usually it's just a multiple, quiz, a multiple choice question that you can get hit with that little fact, but I did want to make sure that I stress it because I've seen it on lots of tests. So... Pretty cool little thing there, especially if it does appear. Call me clutch, huh? Clutch chemistry. So now let's get into a spicer example, right? And I know it says at the very bottom of the screen that we're going to get even spicier. I'm gonna, uh, anyways, remove my face here. We've got a, a simple plug and chug equation here. And kind of diving deeper into the setup that we're working with here. We've got 38 milliliters of a 0.75 molar NaOH solution that is needed to neutralize to fully eradicate all of the acid present in 155 milliliters of an unknown H2SO4 concentration solution. What is the concentration of this unknown solution? 
Yes, there is a way to do this using M1V1 is equal to M2V2. And yet, for some reason, the AP test doesn't vibe with that. And I don't really get why it is a scientifically valid equation. And yet, if you show that as your work to solve this, you will not get an ounce of credit for it. I call bogus on that. And yet, we live in a cruel world. So let's solve this in, I guess, a more intellectually stimulating manner. Because I guess that's what the judges at College Board need. Anyways, you're familiar with rice tables at this point. You know, the reaction, the initial, the change, the equation at the end, the end points, all that jazz. They're a lovely tool to use for this as well. A lovely tool. I hate writing those out. I like to show the more direct step-by-step. -step. I would recommend for yourself to write out these rice tables as you get to use the pencil and paper right in front of you. All that jazz. Let's start with the reaction, because at the end of the day, there is actually nothing new about this math. This is just stoichiometry. And so in this instance, we have sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide. Notice the 1 to 2 molar ratio. Very important to know, because this means I need 2 moles of NaOH to react with the 1 mole of sulfuric acid that's there. Very important. And so let's utilize this volume and this molarity to determine how many moles of NaOH we actually put in there. 0 0.038, that's converting our milliliters to liters, easy peasy, times 0.75 molar is equal to 0 0.0285 moles of sodium hydroxide. This is how much base was put in there, but how much acid is that actually going to react with? Knowing that it is a 1 to 2 molar ratio, we have to divide this value by 2, because that's all the acid that it can get rid of. So, by dividing this by the original volume of the solution, which was the 155 milliliters specified in the uh, question, we can find that the original concentration of the sulfuric acid is 0 0.092. Not so bad, yeah? Not so bad. But it gets saucier. Let's go into the next one. As we said, it can get spicier. So here we are with a different scenario in which we are going to calculate the pH at different points in the titration. Because we are titrating 50 milliliters of 0.100 molar acetic acid with 0.100 molar anyway. So we do know the concentrations of each. And we are going to make a curve effectively is what we were going to do. So I did show you an image a couple slides before that showed you all the different, you know, simulations. If you had a weak acid, strong acid, titrated with strong base, weak base, whatever. That's what we're looking at. But we are going to be calculating the pH at different points. Before we add any base, when we add 10 milliliters of base... When we add 50 milliliters of base, and then lastly, when we add 75.0 milliliters of base. So different points, we should obviously see different things. And so we want to really, really relate these concepts to the math, of course. Because whenever we are faced with this kind of scenario on a for your spot section, we need to be able to actually verbalize the numbers. You can't just settle on the equations and get number answers. You have to be able to explain why this is what it is. So before we add any base, we know that it is just a weak acid present. But we also know that weak acids don't just sit idly. But the thing that different, differentiates weak acids from strong acids is the level at which they dissociate. And so we are simply going to use the Ka value here. They provide it to us as 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. And we are going to solve for x to see exactly how much it dissociates. And therefore use that as a concentration of our hydrogen ions. And because our value ends up being very, very small, whether you're using the rule of 1,000 or you actually calculate the number, you can negate the x in the denominator. Right? You can set this up as your own rice table, but you can negate the x in the denominator because it is so small. And so if you solve this equation out, you get that x is equal to 0 0.00134 molar of our hydrogen ions because it is a one-to-one -one ratio. And therefore, pH of that negative log value is simply going to be 2.87. That should be standard run-of-the-mill. That should be stuff from last unit. But now, if we add 10 milliliters of base here, this is a great opportunity for your rice table. I have written it out a little more explicitly here. That I think it's pretty easy to follow, but I would recommend the table format for you guys on your own end so it's better organized for you. Anyways, the reason why this is not scary, but it is commonly seen as one of the most difficult topics or concepts or techniques in all of AP chemistry, and yet it is nothing new here aside from the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So what are we afraid of? 
I don't know. We are starting with 0 0.001 moles of NaOH. How do we know that? Well, I converted my volume to liters and multiply that by the concentration that is provided to me in the start of the problem to determine how many moles of NaOH are reacted. This is just a stoic problem because I know that for every bit of base that gets dropped into this, this environment, this system in the beaker that is down below this burette, it is going to react with as much acid as it can until one of them runs out. It's either the base is going to run out or the acid is going to run out. So if I calculate the original amount of moles of acetic acid, I know that 0 0.005 moles of acetic acid is going to react with 0 0.001 moles of NaOH, and it is a one-to-one -one molar ratio in this equation. NaOH, acetic acid, we balance it out. There's no coefficients necessary. And so 0 0.001 moles of the acid will be gone, leaving 0 0.004 moles. This is setting itself up just as a standard rice table here. But that also means that I'm making 0 0.001 moles of the conjugate base. Hence, where the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation comes into play. But the biggest thing that trips people up is notice we started originally with 50 milliliters. That is changing over time. We want to find the pH after 10 milliliters of base is added. So not only do I have to account for the changing moles of acid present in the system, I also have to account for the changes in the volume. So I divide my new moles of acid by this new volume, which is now 60 milliliters, not 50 milliliters, to get a new molarity. And I take my moles of my conjugate base over my new volume, and I simply do the Henderson-Hasselbalch, which is the uh, negative log of the Ka or the pKa plus the log of the conjugate base over the acid. Huh? Plug and chug, baby. It ain't that scary. And the pH comes out to be 4.14. That is what we're looking at here. So that's at 10 milliliters. Let's move on to 50.0 milliliters of NaOH. We're going to follow the exact same steps here. And let's see what happens. If we solve this out, we find out that, oh my gosh, the amount of base that we are dispensing into the solution is exactly how many moles of acetic acid is available. Notice we cannot rely upon the values of concentration given to us. Stoic is never done with concentration. It is always done with moles, the most important term in all of chemistry, the most important unit in all of chemistry. And this means if we have the exact same amount of base as acid, this is the equivalence point. That very important definition I told you to note, when the base equals the acid, which means all of the acid will be reactive. But what is actually left behind? Is it NaOH? Or is it the conjugate base chiku that we had to use in our last example? Because, of course, as the acid reacts, we are creating the conjugate base, which means all that is left is the conjugate base. I have zero moles of acetic acid left, but I've got 0 0.005 moles of conjugate base. And now, of course, I've added 50 milliliters of base. I started with 50 milliliters of acid. That means it's a grand total of 100 milliliters. That's why it's divided by 0.1 right here. And that is going to make a concentration of 0 0.05 of our conjugate base. Well, since all that is left is something that is basic, well, we can't use the Ka. What's the point of something that is related to acids when all that is left is a base? Which means we need to find what the Kb of acetic acid is. Because whatever the Kb of acetic acid is, that is going to be our value that is necessary to relate it to its conjugate base. And what is going to tie that all together? None other than the ionization constant of water. 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. And when we sort all of this out here, and we solve for the actual x value in Kb, which if you'll notice, is set up the exact same way as Ka. We're simply solving for it in the equilibrium constant. So what we did here is we did 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by our original Ka, which was 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5th, and we get that the Kb is 5.56 times 10 to the negative 7. Negative 10, sorry. And we know, just as it was in our, conjugate, in our acid, that the conjugate base is not just going to sit there. There is going to be some degree of base ions attaching itself to hydrogen ions in the solution, which is going to form uh, 
two parts to this, two components to this. So we need to see the degree of dissociation. Well, in solving for that, the x, once again, is small enough to ignore. So we simply solve for x, and this is the concentration of the base that we are looking at here. And so we are solving for the pH once again, but all we are left with is a base. So if I do the negative log of this concentration, that's not going to be the pH. That is going to be the pOH. And we get a value of 5.278. So one final step is to do 14 minus that uh, pOH value just calculated to get 8.72. And this answer should make more sense. This is another weird bump in the road that trips up a lot of kids along the way because you have to consider that extra step. But you should also realize, if all I'm left with is a base, how could my pH ever be below 7? It can't be. Therefore, we should note this and know that we must have this extra step in order to get a value that is above 7. 8.72 is our final answer here. So let's go beyond. When 75.0 milliliters of NOH is added, oh my gosh, this is going over the line. We have run out of acid and we have strong base left over, which means, yes, we've created, uh, you know, a good amount of the conjugate base, Chaku, and yet it doesn't even matter because this strong base is in here dominating the pH of the solution. So if you want to think about this in kind of three different phases in, in how this is tracking, right? In the beginning of the scenario, what is dictating the pH? Well, it is simply the weak acid, acetic acid. And as we add more base in, it's the dynamic relationship, that buffer zone between the weak acid and the conjugate base. And there's even a point called the half equivalence point in which the weak acid's concentration match or the weak acid's molar amount is equal to the conjugate base's molar amount. And that is the halfway point, right? The half equivalence point. And that is where is a perfect 50-50 split between the two. And then, of course, as we add more base, the weak acid is less... Uh, dominant in the pH game until eventually there's no acid left and all that is dictating the pH now is the strong base that is in excess here. So if we use phenol phthalein in this situation, this turned pink a while ago, uh, and here we are with just NaOH ions sitting inside the solution, or I should say Na plus OH minus ions left. We've got 0 0.0025 moles of base left over when we do this math. Once again, it's just a soic problem. Everything is moles. And because of this, we can easily find the concentration of our NaOH. And then this is just negative log plug and chug. But because it is base, once again, this is the pOH, which means if we're solving for the pH, we have to do that extra step of doing 14 minus that pOH value to get a value that is significantly above 7, which should be much more realistic to us here. And that is, in terms of buffers, about as spicy of an example as it can get. Not too bad to work with. Not too bad. And thus we get to the last uh, instructional topic of today. That's KSP, the equilibrium of the solubility product. And this is where we are once again betrayed by our predecessors that taught us the first level of chemistry. Maybe it was myself. Maybe it was someone else. Maybe it was Mrs. Kerfuffle. I don't know. But we were taught about solubility rules. And we were shown a chart that told us what compounds dissolved or didn't dissolve in water and of course this is the basis of predicting products for double replacement reactions because a double replacement reaction one of its primary mechanisms is to create a precipitate but here i am to tell you that it was a bit of a lie not too much of a lie but a little bit of a lie nevertheless because everything is soluble to some degree now it can be the most microscopic of amounts but it doesn't matter Water can dissolve some amount of some compound somewhere out there. And if I've got one schmeckle of something that is insoluble, I bet if I threw it into a crystal clear lake of pure water, it could dissolve that small speck. Good chance. And so here we are, finding the equilibrium of this. But you know what's so cool? Is that if you are dissolving a solid, meaning you are starting with a solid in the reactant, and it is forming two aqueous ions in the product, typically, that means the reactant never matters. And in equilibrium expressions, it's always products over reactants. But if the reactant is a solid and solids are never included in the equilibrium expression, well, guess what? There's only one side to this. It's not a fraction at all. Which is why 
We like seeing these on the AP test. We like seeing these on the AP test because the equation is as simple as this. And yes, this is a lot of letters, but this is nothing new. Our subscripts become the coefficient because that is how much we have. And of course, when we're crisscrossing applesaucing to balance those charges, we are going to raise them to certain powers here. So whatever the subscript is, that is going to be the exponent that is raised to. And of course, the charge that we are looking at here is what is needed to satisfy the equation in general. These are nice to solve. Let's take a look at one. We've got copper 1 iodide and titanium 3 carbonate. So we are going to solve for each of them. In this first example, super, super simple. Because we just have uh, the one ion each. And so if we are setting up our expression, we have copper to one, iodine to one. Nothing new here. But when we look at titanium three carbonate, in which we have subscripts of two and subscripts of three, respectively, for those um, cation and anion ions, we are going to raise titanium to the charge associated with it, hence the Roman numeral three. And that subscript of two, it will be raised to the power of two. Nothing new here in terms of our equilibrium expressions. So carbonate will likewise be raised to a power of three because of the subscript of three outside of it. That is how we set up these equilibrium expressions. Easy peasy. So now, if I'm solving for the KSP of silver chromate, Ag2CRO4, which has a KSP value of 8.0 times 10 to the negative 12, a very small value, which goes to show just how small of an amount uh, of this stuff is actually soluble in a certain amount of water. So if I'm solving for this, and I'm looking at these uh, the formula here, I know there's twice as many silver ions in here as chromate ions, which stands to good reason why our equation is set up like so down here. Yes, we've set up our equilibrium expression in which Ag will be raised to the power of 2 squared. It will be chromate that is simply raised to a power of 1 because there's no subscript for it in the formula. So we know that there is going to be some ratio between them, and that ratio is going to be x, but there's going to be twice as many silvers as there are chromates. And so in the end, this simplified expression I can find for virtually any KSP is I can solve for x here. So KSP here will be equal to 4x cubed, and we find that x is going to be equal to 1.26 times 10 to the negative fourth, just using simple algebra here from the KSP that they defined in the problem. And we find that chromates x is going to be the same because it's just a one-to-one -one ratio, but silver is double that. Silver is double that, the 2x here. So that is going to have why, that's why it is twice as much as the chromate. That's a lot of words to show that it is just simple algebra here. So let's see if we can fire up another um, topic here related to this. And I'm going to get my face out of the way here in just a moment. Um, this is known as the common ion effect, something we talked about in the very beginning of our buffer systems. Um, of course, it's relevant here as well. These compounds are dissociating to some extent, albeit a very small extent. But if some of those ions are already present in the solution, then it has already achieved probably significantly past the value that it actually deems as the sweet spot. Because what is equilibrium? It's a very delicate balance of reactants to products, right? And if we already have the intended amount of products in there, then what does it need to shift to the right for? In fact, it doesn't. And it certainly won't do it to the same extent as it did before. So we have that the KSP of silver chloride is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 10. And if we solve for the value of x here to know what the equilibrium concentrations of silver and chlorine are, well, we got this value 1.3 times 10 to the negative fifth. Just x squared, uh, nothing fancy here. So we just do the square root of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 10. We get our x value there. But now, let's say we add 0 0.20 moles of NaCl to 1.0 liters of AgCl. First of all, Na plus doesn't have anything to do with this. No. Absolutely not. It is a spectator ion in this scenario. Absolutely irrelevant. However, the chlorine is completely relevant because silver chloride, when it breaks apart, would form silver plus and Cl minus. And NaCl would break apart into Na plus and Cl minus. So Cl minus, of course, is the commonality between those two. And so if we put in 0 0.20 moles into one liter, which, of course, is concentration, very easy numbers here. That's just going to be a concentration of 0 0.20. Well, that means it is already present in the equation down here. Notice we set up the exact same equation as up above. But instead of solving for x here, we go ahead and fill in this blank here. There's already 0.20 moles of Cl minus in this scenario. 
And so we're just looking for how much silver is present. And wouldn't you know, it is a significantly smaller value than previously determined up here at the top of your screen. Why? Because of the common ion effect. NaCl is more soluble than AgCl, which is why the substance in the scenario with a lesser KSP is going to form a precipitate first. So, of course, in this scenario, that is going to be AgCl, right? The addition of the Cl- minus is going to, in turn, make the amount of Ag plus be reduced in the solution. Kind of cool. Very cool. And, of course, I'm sure there will be some example question that uh, we can kirkin back to for this example. So now, we can also be faced with scenarios such as you have this amount in this amount of water, blah, 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 blah. Will a precipitate form? What did I say at the very beginning of this? Some degree of solubility is happening, right? It could be an incredibly small amount. But if the numbers line up and the stars align, well, you could have a scenario in which you have something that is completely, that is insoluble, commonly, in a specific amount of water in which you wouldn't be able to actually see any solid product form down there, right? And of course... If we were to increase that uh, compound just a little bit more in there, perhaps we would see that solid form. And so this is all about how does Q line up with K? Where, of course, K is the equilibrium constant, and Q is where it presently is over time, right? Q is the value of products over reactants at a given state. Nothing new there. Nothing new. If the value of Q is greater than K, meaning we have shifted too far to the right, we have way more products in there than we should, then we are going to go back to the solid form and a precipitate will occur. However, if Q is equal to or less than K, no precipitate will occur. So we have a solution is made from 200 milliliters of 1.3 times 10 to the negative third molar of silver nitrate mixed with 100.0 milliliters of 4.5 times 10 to the negative fifth sodium sulfide. Will a precipitate occur if the KSP of silver sulfide is 5.5 times 10 to the negative 50, 51. A very small number. Is this not just an extension of what we did in the first level of chemistry where we were predicting products of double replacement reactions? What a short leap away from it, right? You start with silver nitrate, sodium sulfide, what does it make? And here we are. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So, let's plug it in. And, of course, this is, uh, once again, a stoic question to some extent because I'm only going to make so much product. There's going to be some limiting reactant here. And so we've got 2.6 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of silver ions based on the information given to me. We've got 4.5 times 10 to the negative six moles of sulfide ions in solution. Knowing that we need two silvers for each sulfur, right, we can determine that from all of this, we are forming 4.5 times 10 to the negative six moles of AG2S, right? So because the sulfur value was so much smaller than the silver, it didn't even matter that we needed twice as much silver in order to make it happen. The sulfur is so small, right? And uh, just for good measure, I went ahead and found out exactly how many silver ions were remaining in here. Although that's not necessary, you know, there are cool extension questions you could ask yourself to see if you really are understanding what is happening here. Um, but, you know, this question has nothing to do with that. So let's find the molarity of this, right? And so we know that the equilibrium values of these we can solve for. Because if we go up here to silver sulfide and we take that uh, K value, 5.5 times 10 to the negative 50 first, and we solve for what the molarity concentrations of silver and sulfur should be that is deemed soluble in whatever amount of water we are working with, we should be able to work with that here. But we go in here and we find that the molarities of silver and sulfur, right? And we plug it into the Q equation. We simply multiply them by one another. And remember, because there are twice as many silvers as sulfurs, we raise it to the power of two here. So this is simply our K expression. But of course, because this is not equilibrium, that is why it is Q. And we find that the answer value here is 1.13 times 10 to the negative 11, a significantly larger value than 5.5 times 10 to the negative 51st. When Q is greater than K, meaning we've shifted far too far to the right, we have way too many products in the dissociation of this original silver sulfide expression, we need to shift back to silver sulfide, which means we need to go back to the solid. So yes, a precipitate will occur. And that is actually all of the topics for the day. It's a bulky unit, as it were, 
but I actually find this a little strange that we don't talk about titrations and buffers with the acids and bases in, in previous talks. Um, so it's, it feels kind of a little out of place, and then you just kind of randomly throw KSB in with it. Um, and it does take practice. There's a few, obviously we talked about that titration problem with all the extra details in it, that it, there's a lot of curveballs in there that could throw some people off. Um, but once you, you know, practice with a little bit of them, which of course these sample problems are going to help us do, um, you, you know what to look for, right? There's only a few things you can do. There's not any new math here aside from the henderson hasselbeck equation, which is pretty cool. So let's go into the sample multiple choice and free response questions that I pulled from a review book. A student titrates 20 milliliters of a one molar strong base with two molar formic acid, a weak acid with a Ka of 1.8 times 10 to the negative fourth. And it specifies that it's a monoprotic acid, meaning that this first, uh, the first H probably isn't going to fall off of it, right? That it's going to be the second H that's going to fall off of it. So how much formic acid is necessary to reach the equivalence point? This is very important. This is, this is why we stress that definition in the very beginning. The equivalence point is when the moles of base equals the moles of acid, period, end of story. It doesn't care about strong versus weak, weak versus strong. It doesn't care about that whatsoever. So if I know that there's 20 milliliters of one molar NaOH, I can find out how many moles of base that is. But the fact that it's twice as the concentration, then I would need half the volume in order to equal the moles of base present in here. So this is a simple answer. It's simply 10 milliliters. But where they try to throw you off is they go, oh my gosh, it's it's a weak acid. Can can that really take on the strong base in a one-to-one -one ratio? Yes, it can. Stoic doesn't care about strong or weak. It cares about acid base, period. That's it, right? So the answer is simply going to be 10 milliliters. Easy peasy. Now, at the equivalence point, is the solution acidic, basic, or neutral? An interesting question here. Let me phase my face out of here. An interesting question here. So we have our formic acid on the bottom. Right? But either way, what are we reacting? We've got this formic acid that can break apart into a conjugate base. Sorry, I'm just kind of blinking my face in and out of here. This formic acid dissociates into a conjugate base, and so once all the NaOH and the formic acid is reacted, what remains? And the answer is what formic acid becomes after it is done reacting. That is the conjugate base. And so at the equivalent point, and this is very similar to a problem we did here, where once we reach the equivalent point, all that we had left was the conjugate base. And if all that you're left with is a conjugate base, doesn't it stand to good reason that you would be basic? So, first of all, let's assess a couple of things here. Let's just go with law of probability. Uh, I would say in most situations here, you're going to have two acidics, two basics, right? But a neutral is a very relevant question here um, because you have an acid getting with a base. But we should also note that if a strong base is being titrated with a weak acid, where is the equivalence point going to be found? And these charts are kind of, they're, they're very good at showing that. So, which one is it here? Weak acid, strong base. The equivalence point is above 7 here, is what we are looking at here. It's positioned kind of here, which looks to be 8-ish or so. Maybe a little past 8 um, on average. So, that's a sort of logic thing here. But I would understand why some people would gravitate towards the equivalence point always being 7, because acids cancel out bases. Um, it does matter for the equivalence point where the pH is actually going to reside. But one mole of weak acid will neutralize one mole of strong base, right? That's what we're calculating here. Uh, but the reason why the answer is basic to some degree here is because the only thing that is present is the conjugate base. And, of course, because it is a conjugate base, the answer is basic. But, of course, let's, let's do some test-taking strategy 101. I've got one answer choice that's acidic, two that are basic, one that is neutral. The answer is likely going to be basic, right? Likely. So even then just test taking strategy 101, you can make that into a 50-50 shot there just picking the basic answers. But um, C is, what a stupid answer. The higher concentration of the base is the determining factor. That's not even, you have one molar of strong base, two molar of weak acid. So it, it doesn't even make sense. Um, so really, I think B is the only logical answer. Um, but yeah. Yeah.
strong base, weak acid, bim, bam, boom. Now, if the formic acid were replaced with a strong acid such as HS HCl at the same concentration, how would that change the volume needed to reach the equivalence point? Once again, they're preying on you not knowing what the equivalence point actually is. Strong acid, strong base, oh, I don't know! The equivalence point is when base equals acid, period, end of story. Period, end of story. So, it's the same concentration. It's a monoprotic acid. Does it matter that it's a strong acid now versus a weak acid? It absolutely doesn't matter. The only thing that's going to change here is it is going to change the pH at the equivalence point. Because we are changing what is actually present in the solution at this time here. There's no conjugates to worry about here. You simply have a salt and water, which means a strong base, strong acid gets together and makes a neutral pH at the equivalence point. But our answers, let's go over them. The change would reduce the amount as the acid now fully dissociates. Oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. Don't pick this answer. The change would reduce the amount because the base will be more strongly attracted to the acid. Oh, what a world, what a world. The change would increase the amount because the reaction went out to go to completion instead of equilibrium. Whatever the heck th that means, that's a sure is a string of words that are English. Changing the strength of the acid will not change the volume needed to reach equivalence. And voila! We find our answer. All we care about are moles of acid is equal to moles of base. So the volume does not change here because the concentration is the same. As long as the concentration of HCl is the same as the formic acid that we started with, the volume needed to reach the equivalent point will not change. 150 milliliters of saturated strontium fluoride solution is present in a 250 milliliter beaker at room temperature. The molar solubility of strontium fluoride at 298 Kelvin is 1.0 times 10 to the negative third molar. How could the concentration of strontium ions in solution be decreased? The lovely common ion effect. And we did the equation. Very similar to this. But actually, this is one of those where you can pretty much memorize the structure of these kinds of questions. Because what did we do to actually decrease the amount of those ions that were present in the solution? Let's go back to the screen. Right? Oops, this one. What do we do? Well, we didn't add in silver ions to decrease the silver ions. Right? We actually added in chlorine ions to decrease the metal ions. So, the similar pattern is, is done here as well. Right? If we are at, if we're trying to decrease the amount of strontium ions, then we need to add in fluorine ions. So, our, or fluoride ions, I should say. So, all we're doing is we're looking for the fluoride here. Uh, and the answer, of course, is going to be A because of that. Let's look at our other choices here. B, definitely going to be your most incorrect your mostly picked incorrect response so that's the second hottest choice um but heating the solution in the beaker yes heating is going to increase solubility of things typically um if you'll recall solubility curves in in your first level of chemistry right so temperature generally increases the solubility of things so that's not going to be uh, decreasing the strontium ions actually and, and if anything it would be increasing um adding a small amount of water to the beaker but not dissolving all of the solid it, like that's just words if you add more water wouldn't that dissolve more right isn't that how solubility works if i've got more stuff to dissolve it am i gonna i'm, not, I'm gonna dissolve more stuff right but i don't even get what the point of the second half of this choice is right but not dissolving all the solid e either way you are going to be um dissolving more of the strontium ions so how are you going to decrease the strontium ions is the question so c and d don't make any sense um so a is is the only valid choice here the only valid choice here because it is going to break apart and form those fluoride ions in there, which means it's going to cause us to shift too far to the right and go back to the original solid that is formed. Um, that common ion effect, once again, is the reasoning behind this. Between HOCl and HOF, let me get my face out of the way, which would be the stronger acid and why? And we do have their structures on the next screen here for us. Well, let's look at our choices here for just a moment. HOC, it's a coin flip for both of them, right? We've got two at HOCl, two at HOF, and of course the reason behind it are exact opposites of one another. Because the HO bond is weaker than an HOF, as chlorine is larger than fluorine. Because the HO bond is stronger than an HOF, as chlorine has higher electronegativity. La, 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 same reasoning for that. So let's talk about this. Let's go to our structures here, where I have strategically placed my face out of the way. Here we have HOF, HOCl. Very similar looking structures. The only difference is what halogen is oxygen attached to. Which brings us back to 
polarity of bonds and what is dictating polarity of bonds and what is dictating a stronger bond intra versus intermolecular forces so many things at play here the radii of certain atoms i know that fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table and chlorine is not too far behind and oxygen's up there too but how does that play a role in these relationships here and if these are both acids what is going to make it a stronger acid well, let's first of all decipher that the best acid the strongest acid is the one that is going to produce the most h pluses in the solution right isn't that what differentiates a strong acid from a weak acid total dissociation versus partial dissociation that's the definition of strong versus weak so effectively i'm looking for who is going to drop more h's into the tank and here is the dynamic which is very very much related to bonding and not really acids bases um but whoever's got the stronger bond over here inherently means they are going to have the weaker bond with the hydrogen and whoever has the weakest bond with hydrogen is going to be more readily able to lose it so between oxygen and fluorine and oxygen and chlorine which is a stronger bond and why well what is a bond a bond is an investment of electrons between two interested parties. They both want to be happy on the other side of this, right? And which is able to keep a closer eye on its electrons, fluorine or chlorine? Well, as you go down on the periodic table, you add energy levels to the structure of your atom, which increases the size of your atom. So fluorine is smaller. Chlorine is larger, which means fluorine is able to get all snugly close with oxygen much closer to oxygen than chlorine is able to do. And so oxygen is able to be more strongly attracted to fluorine than it is to chlorine. And therefore the hydrogen on the HOF is going to be more readily able to be lost. So let's look at what answer choice lines up with that. Let's get my face out of the way again. The HO bond is weaker than an HOF as chlorine is larger than fluorine. This is the right reasoning, but the wrong answer, of course right we just said that hof is going to be the stronger acid because the oxygen fluorine bond is stronger than the oxygen chlorine bond so our answers are going to be c and d or c or d right hof is the right answer so the ho bond is stronger than hocl as fluorine has a higher electronegativity than chlorine fluorine does have a higher electronegativity than chlorine these are tricky answer choices because it provides a valid fact at the end that a lot of us might jump onto because this is a very common honors chemistry fact that we remember but it's not right. The hydrogen to oxygen bond being stronger is is not good, right? So we, we, we don't want the stronger bond here because that's going to make the hydrogen more likely to stay attached to this structure. So D is our correct answer because the HO bond is weaker than an HOCl as fluorine is smaller than chlorine. Once again, they are able to get more snugly, which means it's going to care less about this hydrogen being here. So this hydrogen is going to fall off because fluorine is smaller. It's higher in electronegativity, all that jazz. The only answer here that makes sense is D. Ta-da! We move on. We've got a titration curve here. Great curve. Great curve. You're going to have to do these in your AP lab. No doubt, no doubt about it. It's just a very generic equation at the top, which you guys can't even see on your screen, right? I'm just going to throw this down here for just a moment. Ta-da! HA plus OH makes A minus H2O. So we've got a base weak acid, all that jazz. Which chemical species present in the solution dictates the pH of the solution in each of the volume ranges below? So notice we have the weak acid is going to be starting down below, and we are putting this strong base into it, right? Let me get my face out of the way here. So from 1 to 14 milliliters, which of course on this chart is here to here, right? And it's looking like e the equivalence point, so where the acid is equaling the base, is about 15 milliliters, right? Is what we're looking at here, the middle of this curve. So 1 to 14 is what we're looking at here. What is dictating the pH of that solution? This is going to be us here getting back to our buffer discussion, our more intense example where we calculated the pH at different uh, volumetric levels in that range every bit of base that you add so we're not at zero notice that they kind of skipped over zero which is very interesting here um so they didn't even talk about before any base was added because the only thing that's present there is the weak acid right 
Well, it's dissociating to some extent, but the thing that is most dominating the pH, of course, is the weak acid. But as we are hitting 1 milliliter of 14 milliliters, it is that buffer region in which the weak acid and the conjugate base are dancing back and forth with one another. So it is going to be HA and A minus that are dictating the pH of this relationship here. Let me move my camera over here. How about that? Ta-da. How about that? So now at 15 milliliters, well, this is going to be very similar to one of our math equations. At 15 milliliters, this is where they're roughly saying is the equivalence point, right? It seems like it's kind of a little off shape with it if I'm just trying to draw the line. I feel like that doesn't hit the middle of this straightish point, but whatever. Um, either way, this is the equivalence point. 15 milliliters is how much it takes to neutralize all of the acid. What is present at this point? It is not NaOH. Because every bit of any OH we put in there has reacted with all of the HA, whatever that weak acid is. The only thing that is present at the equivalence point is the conjugate base. So A minus is the answer that they are looking for. A minus, the conjugate base. And then beyond that, what is dictating the pH? Everything that we've added after the fact is all strong base. It's all NaOH, all right? Or OH minus, whatever you want to say. Um, that is what is dictating the pH there right? This is exactly the same scenario as our buffer situation without all the math. How nice is that? And this is a free response question. I like that. At which volume is the weak acid greater than A minus, right? Well, we've very much honed in on the fact that we are talking about equivalence points, and we've only briefly mentioned half equivalence point. Half equivalence point is when the weak acid and the conjugate base are in perfect symmetry with one another. The amount of weak acid equals the amount of conjugate base. And so if it takes 15 milliliters to get to the equivalence point, guess where the half equivalence point is? Precisely half of that. So that's 7.5 milliliters. At 7.5 milliliters, the weak acid will equal the conjugate base. So that means the weak acid will be greater than the conjugate base from 0 to 7.5 milliliters as we are traveling down this track. Pretty logical there. Um, but we only briefly mentioned half equivalence point here because it, it's not it, it's it's not too prevalent, but of course you should know it. But it's also equivalence point, half equivalence point, makes a whole bunch of sense just to cut it in half. Um, when does the weak acid equal the concentration of our conjugate base? Well, my goodness, what did we just say? This is the half equivalence point. So... The answer is at 7.5 milliliters, specifically 7.5 milliliters. There's no range here, right? It's not like the other values. And when is the weak acid lesser, less than the conjugate base? Well, it's anything after the fact. It's going to be 7.5 milliliters and onward. Because even once we hit the equivalence point and all of the acid has been reacted and is therefore gone, um, we still have conjugate base present in the solution. So zero is always going to be less than something that is not zero. And so the answer for part three should be 7.5 onward, which they don't show how far this graph goes. I don't know, like 30 milliliters, something like that. Um, but pretty pretty logical question here. And this is free response, right? Very easy to process, just using that terminology that we gained in, in this today. So now, at which point in the titration, if any, would the concentration of the following species be equal to zero? meaning no margin for error. It has to be zero just by your answers. And this is kind of tricky here. And I'm also, I'm kind of half wondering if they would actually accept two alternate answers here. There is a correct answer, and then there's a, well, maybe I give it to you kind of answer. Um, and I know what a lot of people would be leaning towards, especially after our conversation today. But also, you're pretty fresh off of all these other equilibrium conversations, so maybe it's not too too far out of the question, realm of possibility for you to decipher this. Um... Even when we haven't put any base in, and the weak acid is sitting in that beaker all by itself, dissolved in water, whatever, is it only the weak acid in there? No. There is some degree to which it dissociates. That's the Ka that you're looking at. It is going to make some amount of the conjugate base. And so what I think the, the answer that is incorrect that people would lean towards after our conversation here today is, well, anything after the equivalence point. After the equivalence point, all of the acid, all of the HA is gone. But that's not 100% valid. Because guess what? When you are in that solution, you've got water, 
you've got a minus at the equivalence point, guess what happens? Water falls off of the H2O and reattaches onto the A minus, which means even if there's one molecule of HA somewhere in that solution, it is not a value of zero. So the answer, strangely enough, is actually there is no point in this titration in which either of those species would be zero. There is always some degree in which there's a little bit of weak acid or the conjugate base. Uh, the biggest argument for where there would be no A minus would be at zero milliliters of base added. Why? Because there's only weak, ba weak acid in there. But weak acid dissociates to form A minus and H plus on its own. It doesn't need a base in there to do that. That is what equilibrium is all about. Likewise, A minus will always attach with hydrogen ions to make HA to some degree. That's what KB is all about. And so the answer is actually none. No point on this titration. Kind of cool. Kind of cool. If the titration were performed again, but this time with two molar NaOH, so twice the concentration as before, name two things that would change about the titration curve and explain the reasoning behind your identified changes. Um, so let me get my face out of the way just so you can read that question. Pretty self-explanatory, though. Uh, it, if it takes... If we, we have double the concentration, that means for every drop that we put in there, we're putting in twice as much OH-, which, of course, is what we care about in getting rid of the acid. So if it takes 15 milliliters to get rid of all of the acid, it's going to take half as much, right? So this curve is going to be shifted to the left, effectively. That's one of the changes that's going to take place. So it's going to take 7.5 milliliters to reach the equivalence point um, of this titration. That's one change, right? Everything would be shifted down. The change would occur twice as fast. Secondly, at the very end, when everything is all said and done, if this thing is still going to go on to the same duration at 30 milliliters, we have twice as much OH- minus in there, which means if we've got twice as much OH- minus in there, we've got twice the concentration of it, which means the final pH is going to be higher and higher and higher because there's more OH- minus in there. Simple math, simple calculations, simple changes, I think, to talk about. I think a lot of people would miss that secondary change, though. Um, the amount of OH would be different. Therefore, the pH is going to be higher there. It's going to be a stronger base here. So now we've got a free response question talking about KSP. Cool, cool, cool. The value of the solubility product KSP for calcium hydroxide is 5.5 times the negative 6 at 25 degrees Celsius. We've got it separated into four parts. Write the KSP expression. How many grams we got in there? What is the pH of part B? And then, of course, if we change something, what would it happen in D? We separated this into two slides for you. Let's plug and chug here. KSP, as we know, is simply equal to those ion expressions. And if there is a coefficient attached to it, then that is going to become the exponent of whatever you were looking at here. So, because there are twice as many hydroxides as calciums here, you cannot forget that exponent of 2 on the outside of hydroxide here. Very important. Obviously, if you don't have that 2, it's not going to be right here. And if you miss this part here, that's going to throw off your calculations in B. And because C is dependent upon B, you're going to be thrown off there as well. So B, what is the amount of grams of calcium hydroxide in 500 milliliters of, notice, a saturated solution? So it's hit right at that sweet spot at 25 degrees Celsius. They give us the expression here. And notice how we wrote this out here for you. Because it is, once again, a 1 to 2 ratio in this formula, there's 1 calcium for every 2 hydroxides. We can solve for this, once again, as 4x cubed. You'll notice that's a very, very common KSP um, template for things. Either way, we get that x is equal to 0 0.01, which, because calcium is equal to x, that is going to be the concentration of Ca2+. And if that is the concentration of Ca2+, then that is also the concentration of CaOH2. So converting that to moles from molarity times the 0.5 liters here from the volume given to us in the question, we find out that there's 0 0.005 moles of calcium hydroxide. And then we simply multiply that by the molar mass and get the grams. 0.37 grams, very, very small amount of mass here. But that's, it's like a very, very small addition to something that you could have done in honors or pre-AP chemistry. Not too big of a deal there, right? Just solving for that KSP expression. Notice how, like, this is not too many lines of work here. I loved when these were popping up on AP tests. But we go to part C. The value of KSP, once again, what is the pH in B? This is simple. If you did B correctly, and what's cool about C is even if you did B incorrectly, if you do the math correctly with whatever your wrong answer was in B, nice. 
So if the concentration of Ca2 plus is 0 0.01, guess what the concentration of OH minus is? It's going to be double that because X2X. And the concentration of OH minus is how you find pH pOH. So if we do the negative log of 0 0.02, that is going to be equal to the pOH because once again, this is a base. And so that secondary step that has been tacked onto half of these questions we've done here today, 14 minus that number will equal the pH of 12.3. And then D, it's saying, well, what if we add hydroxide ions to this scenario? What is going to happen to the amount of calcium ions in solution? This is that common ion effect that we've seen in two different iterations here today. We know that the calcium is going to decrease. That's what the common ion effect does. But to just how much? Well, you are going to plug in this one mole, which because it's 500 milliliters of solution, we are going to plug that in and discover the molarity is 2.0. And we're going to simply plug that into the KSP expression and solve for the lone X that is here. And we get an answer of 1.4 times 10 to the negative 6 molar, just like the one done in our notes. Not too shabby there. Not too shabby. Whew. I think this is our last one. I think it's our last one. A student performs an experiment to determine the concentration of a solution of hypochlorous acid, whose Ka is 3.5 times 10 to the negative 8. Student starts with 25 milliliters of the acid in a flask and titrates it against a standardized solution of sodium hydroxide with a concentration of 1.47 molar. The equivalence point is reached after the addition of 34.23. So already just from the setup of this question, you can probably guess like what the parts of the question are going to be. I... Like, it's the same question they ask on every single one of these. But anyways, we separate into different slides for you. What is the net ionic equation for the reaction that occurs in the flask? What they're trying to get you on here is what is important and what is not important. Spectator ions. Um, the acid matters here. The base matters here. But you know what doesn't matter with the base is the thing that the OH is attached to, which, of course, is sodium. So because it's a net ionic equation, you can eliminate the Na pluses from this. That's the only thing you can eliminate here. And so HOCl is going to form OCl minus the conjugate base and water from here. Pretty simple there. I feel like an honors chemistry person could do that. Let me get my face out of the way here. What is the concentration of the HOCl? Well, this is simply a stoic problem. With the amount of base that we added with a known concentration of 1.47 molar, I can determine how many moles of NaOH were added. And for every mole of NaOH that was added, a mole of OH was added. And at the equivalence point, moles of base equals mole of acid easy peasy and so if 0 0.0503 moles of NaOH was added guess what there were 0 0.0503 moles of HCO, HOCl at the start and so if we divide that by the starting volume of 25 milliliters we get that the concentration is not exactly two molar but 2.01 molar I, I always find it funny whenever they do those numbers that are just off the whole number it's like they're intentionally it's like you could potentially just randomly guess it, put some work down, and maybe they would give you credit for it. But ever so slightly off is what they're going for here. Uh, so once again, what would the pH of the solution in the flask be after the addition of 28.55 milliliters? Oh, my goodness. Is this not exactly like the titration problems that we did earlier in this video? We are going to be utilizing the henderson hasselbalch equation, which is simply, simply a stoic problem. It is simply a stoic problem. So if we determine how many moles of base were added, that is going to react with that same amount of moles of acid, which means plug in all this in, we've got 0 0.0083 moles of HOCl left, which is going to form the same amount of moles of conjugate base as the moles of base added. So I've got 0 0.0420 moles of OCl minus, and I've got 0 0.0083 moles of HOCl. And they gave me the KA, so I can easily find the pKa. And of course... The pH is equal to the negative log of the Ka, or the pKa, plus log of the conjugate base's concentration over the acid's concentration. Concentration, not moles, which is why here we had to solve for the new molarity. And we had to account for the fact that we've added 28.55 milliliters to something that started out at 25 milliliters, which means we actually have 53.55 milliliters in this final part of the solution. And we get that the pH is equal to 8.2. We are just about out of the acid here. So let's go back and we'll kind of talk about the conceptual side of part D here. The actual concentration of the HOCl is found to be 2.25 molar. Quantitatively discuss whether or not each of the following errors could have caused the error in the student's results. 
these kinds of things are very frequently tacked on to these query response questions. You have to be able to explain the numbers. There are concepts behind everything. That's why I think chemistry is so nice. Because the math and the concepts go hand in hand. It doesn't feel like all these other things where you're stranded on an island. If I don't know the numbers or I don't know the concepts, they go together, right? It's hard to know one without the other. So you have to know the concepts applying to the numbers. The student added additional NaOH past the equivalence point. Well, by golly, how on earth is that going to affect our estimated concentration of HOCl? right? If I added more base than I actually needed to, well, then that's going to seem like there was more acid in the original solution. So duh, that's going to throw it off. That's going to make it seem like it is a higher concentration than it actually was. la -da! The student rinsed the burette with distilled water, but not with the NaOH solution before filling with NaOH. This one, I feel like, is an easy question once you have done this in class. We're getting our cardio in, moving back and forth across the screen. Once you've done this in class, you know why you have to do this. Because you are very meticulously looking at how that is dropping on the burette, right? And if there is not only NaOH coming out when you start, that is going to throw off your calculations. But how? Well, if the first part that is coming out of your burette is straight water, which means it's not doing anything to the acid, but that is accounting for volume that is in your burette, then that means you're going to have to dispense more volume than was actually necessary in order to reach the equivalence point, which is once again going to increase the concentration of your acid that you would, or your perceived concentration. Your, your estimated value would be higher than it actually is because you had to put in more volume than you were actually supposed to. Then, let me get my face out of the way. The student measured the volume of acid incorrectly. Instead of adding 25.00 milliliters of weak acid, only 24.00 milliliters was present in the flask prior to titration. Uh, so this, what's weird about this is, yeah, it's going to change your final calculation, but not as, I think, as badly as the, the first two. Um, I mean, I, really as a, scientists where are you most going to go wrong i think it's in the, the manual process not in the beginning stuff like beginning measurements are the easiest stuff um but anyways it's going to throw off your your mole calculations your when you're doing your your titration curve all that jazz because you're, you're you have more volume shown in your calculations and was actually present so it is going to throw it off and i feel like it's pretty logical on why it's going to throw it off but it's like these are the kinds of things that i know a lot of us like to see these kinds of questions on the free response section of these tests because you can logically work through them. Even if you have no idea what the heck is going on in buffers and titrations, I know that my original volume was off and volume, of course, is related to the amount of moles that are present in there. Yeah. But also, most of your calculations are contingent upon how much base is being added. So as long as you're accurate with the base that's being dispensed, you know how many moles were present in there. Um, so outside of actually calculating the concentration of the acid, which of course would be contingent upon how much volume is in there, um, you actually wouldn't have anything wrong with that. But of course, this question is talking about finding the concentration. So quite important. Um, and I'm sure many of you are encountering labs in class in which you must be spot on accurate. And if you're not, Boo-hoo! That's Corona Chemistry! We'll see you next time.